Good afternoon. It's good to see one, everyone back for our afternoon worship. As, as usual, we have visitors among us, and we're thankful for that. Just got, received word from uh, Brian that the uh, youth group is on its way back, probably be here around 4 or 4.30. So, again, we want to remember them in our prayers as they travel back home. First song this afternoon will be number 982. Number 982, We Shall Assemble. We shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne. With humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song. Glory and honor and dominion. Unto the Lamb, unto the King. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing the song of the redeemed. Before our brother Michael comes and leads us in our opening prayer, we'll sing number 953, 955, sorry. Slide's wrong. Somebody did that. I guess that was me. <laughs> 955. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day. We want to thank you for the many blessings. At the conclusion of our lesson this afternoon, we'll sing number 667 as the Lord's invitation is extended. 667, if you'd like to mark that book and that page in your hymnal. Prior to our lesson, let's sing number 37. Number 37. I will tell you, I've never attempted, I don't think, to lead this song, but 
It's a familiar song to many of us, and if I mess it up, just drown me out. Angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. They the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the lip. Love one another, thus sets the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the blessed command. Love is much too pure and holy. Friendship is too sacred for. For a moment's reckless folly, thus to death so late and more. Love one another, thus said the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus said the Savior. Children obey the blessed command. Angry words are lightly spoken. Bitterest thoughts are rashly stood. Brightest leaks of life are broken by a single angry word. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the blessed command. Good afternoon. If you have your Bible, would you be turning to Joshua chapter 22? Joshua chapter 22. I don't know if anyone thought we would be done this morning after we covered chapter 23 and 24, uh, but we are going to go back to chapter 22 for one more lesson uh, from the book of Joshua, and then we'll be done uh, with that. We'll move on to some other topics that we would like to consider, uh, but I appreciate you um, considering these things. A lot of you have said you enjoyed this book. It's very encouraging. A lot of good things we've looked at so far. As we said, part of the point of doing this was to encourage our young people as they were uh, going through the uh, preparation for the Bible Bowl, and they took the test a couple of weeks ago, but now we are still preparing. We'll be preparing in the coming weeks uh, for the competition at the convention, which was uh, Easter weekend always. We'll be going to Nashville, God be willing, and be looking forward to that. And so we appreciate your prayers and your encouragement of them. I will make mention uh, of one note. Uh, in connection with that, we had isolated a, a Sunday a couple of weeks ago on our calendar to maybe have the young people present the things that they've worked on, some of the ones who are leading singing and that kind of thing. Our young ladies have done that with the ladies' class before, and uh, we just kind of pushed that out for now. So probably maybe when we get back from that, but we'd still like to pick a time, a Sunday afternoon or evening, when our young men can uh, present some of their speeches and song leading and that kind of thing and give the uh, girls a chance in front of some of the ladies to present those things. Uh, so we do appreciate your encouragement there and look forward uh, to that. I need to say one other thing. If you've already glanced over here uh, at the numbers board, that's not a preacher count. Uh, that's Jerry Renfro's fault. So, and he's already texted and apologized. But if you thought the preacher counted 208, it wasn't me. So, uh, I think we had 108 this morning, though, which is really good. It's the largest crowd we've had in a while. Uh, but for those of you who are wondering where we stuck everybody, that's not 208. If you were here, no, it was not. Um, but we're thankful for the good crowd this morning and thankful you're here uh, this afternoon as we think about this lesson together from chapter 22. 
Uh, I don't know, again, if you had ever skipped over chapter 22 or ever read Joshua chapter 22. When you think about some of the things that are included, we've talked about skipping over, uh, you know, the mention of the land and the division of the land and that kind of thing. Uh, but there's still something to be learned from it, of course. There's still some encouragement that could be found there. In fact, there is a almost civil war between the children of Israel. And we're going to see as they work through this that maybe there are a few lessons for us as we think about conflict resolution. You know, I always tell you, you've probably heard me say it a bunch of times, that I'm kind of non-confrontational. It doesn't, uh, you know, excite me. I kind of shy away from it. And many people who maybe find themselves not necessarily in conflict for fun, but among conflict, they say, well, you know, I don't like it either. But certainly we understand it's something we have to deal with. And in fact, sometimes problems can fester in the church and among brethren when we don't confront things and sort of go through some healthy conflict resolution. And again, we'll come to it at the end of our lesson, but I think you'll see there are some good points from Joshua chapter 22 here. Uh, let's begin with a bit of history, and that history included the fact that there are two and a half tribes that are headed home. Well, let's explain what that means, and by the way, in just a moment, I'm going to throw up there one of my maps that you've seen before and try to describe it for you with a map, um, but the Israelites have now conquered Canaan, essentially. As we talked about this morning, one of the themes of Joshua is the idea of rest. And before he gets to those speeches in chapter 23 and the covenant that made at Shechem there in chapter 24, uh, there is this kind of commentary that they are at, going to be at rest. They had conquered Canaan. They had divided its land among their tribes. And what has happened here at the beginning of chapter 22 is that Joshua, you see there in verse 1, if you've turned to that passage, Joshua has called the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, our kids hate that phrase because it's in a bunch of our questions over this section. And I have to repeat it every time we read those questions in Bible Bowl practice. But the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, what happened to them? Well, they're headed home after all this time. Go with me in your memory, and if you want to turn there, you can for just a moment, all the way back to Joshua chapter 1. And we studied that the very first Sunday of this month, and we pointed out the fact that when God speaks to Joshua and encourages him and tells him here's what he needs to do, at the very end of chapter 1, there is this section where the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh are going to stay on that east side. I guess I'll go ahead and put it up there now. I drew a bit of a red line, if you can see it. They are right in the middle between the two great bodies of water where the uh, Jordan River was. And you see on that right-hand side, if you can make it out, Reuben... Gad and Manasseh. So as they're on the east side and they're getting ready to walk across the Jordan River on dry ground, right? We know that that's going to occur. When they do, Joshua tells the people, you Reubenites, Gadites, and half-tribe of Manasseh, you need to send mighty men of valor or fighting men across the river with us. Help us conquer the middle. Help us conquer the south. Help us conquer the north. And then you can go home. And so here we see again that that happens that's taken place. Those mighty men of valor have gone. They've helped fight. They've helped conquer the land of Canaan on the west side of the Jordan. And now they're ready to make that trip back home to be with their brethren and to enjoy that rest. You see there in verses uh, really two through five that Joshua gives them some instructions. He charges them in verse five to love and serve God with all their heart and soul. And even in verses six through eight, of Joshua chapter 22. He's going to bless them and he's going to permit them to take home some of the spoils that they had received from their victories in Canaan. Now, once again, we recall that with Achan, they were told not to take things from Jericho. Achan does, the, takes of the accursed things, so there's that problem. But from then on, at various times, God says you can take the spoils of war, what you get when you conquer these people, and you can divide it out as an inheritance among the people. So he gives them instructions, and he says, you are willing or you're able, we'll let you to take these things home, and you can travel back home to be with your family. And so that's pretty much seems nice and simple, doesn't it? I mean, a nice, happy conclusion. We're done. We've won the battles. We're ready for rest. And so let's take all that we have here and take it home and divide it among the people. All sounds really, really good. And that's usually when things go really, really bad, right? In movies sometimes, in television shows, and things like that. So the next thing that occurs then in this particular story of chapter 22 
is one altar and three accusations. Now let me explain here, and you can follow along, beginning in verse number 10. As they began to travel home, it says, And when they came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh built an altar there by the Jordan, a great and impressive altar. I wish I knew more about that altar, don't you? Maybe it sounds very interesting. Sounds pretty good. I don't know if it was really, really tall. I don't know if it was made of the fanciest stone or rock that they could find. But obviously, on their journey home, they come to this area of the Jordan River, and they're going to make this altar. That's all we know here in verse number 10. They build an altar, and it is great, and it is impressive. But in verse number 11, we see this change. This conflict is coming. And in verse number 11, it says, Now the children of Israel, that would mean pretty much everyone else who was going to stay on the west side, the children of Israel heard someone say behold the children of Reuben the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh have built an altar on the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the children of Israel's side verse 12 and when the children of Israel heard of it the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered together at Shiloh to go to war against them now, this is one of those plot twists and plot moving very quickly that you kind of have to stop and say, now, wait a second, what exactly happens here? Now, if you have the New King James, that's what I'm reading from in verse number 11. I find it interesting the way it's worded there, but it says, the children of Israel heard someone say. Almost sounds like gossip, right? I heard somebody say, and what happens when we often hear gossip, today, even in today's world, gossip war right I mean there's a little bit of gossip let's go to battle somebody said something we got to go find out let's go to battle over it and cause all these issues well I mean that is kind of the way it reads if you have a different version it doesn't exactly say heard someone say in verse number 11 but verse 12 does say that when they heard of it so word gets back to the children of Israel uh, and their initial response to the news of the altar is that they want to go to war they prepare to go to war, the tribes west of the Jordan, against the tribes that are going to be east of the Jordan. And so in verses 13 and 14, they take Phineas, the priest, and they send a delegation, including Phineas and a ruler from each tribe, in verses 13 and 14. And there are some serious accusations that were made. The western tribes, what's kind of referred to as the children of Israel in this particular section, those western tribes accused their brethren from Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben of three things. I didn't put these for you to write out, but you can notice them in verses 16 and 18. We'll go back to verse 15, and you notice that this delegation comes to them. And in verse 16, they say, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What? treachery is this that you have committed against the Lord excuse me against the God of Israel to turn away this day from following the Lord and that you have built for yourselves an altar that you might rebel this day against the Lord and even down in verse 18 they say but that you must turn away this day from following the Lord now, there's a mention in verse 17 of the iniquity of Peor. That is a reference back to an account in Numbers, uh, num uh, Numbers chapter uh, 25, I believe. Yes, Numbers chapter 25, where there was some idolatry among the people, and there was a plague that came on because of that. And so they, that's what they're referencing there. But you notice three things here. Number one, verse 16, they say they accuse them of committing treachery against Jehovah. Number two, in verses 16 and 18, they uh, accuse them of turning away from God, committing treachery, turning away from God. And number three, in verse number 16, they accuse them of rebelling against the Lord. Those are some strong accusations. Those are some pretty strong words from one side uh, of the children of Israel to the other. They, these are some serious things that were said among them. Well, what's the problem? Why were they so concerned about this particular altar? Well, they concluded that the new altar was evil. Look at verse number 19, and you'll see that they're thinking, they concluded the new altar was evil, thinking that it had been built 
to be used for offering sacrifices to Jehovah. And in verse 19, we see that it is an altar besides the altar of the Lord. Now, if you know your Bible history, you know that going forward into the book of the Kings and the books of the Chronicles, that that's a problem, right? Men take it upon themselves to build their own altar in unauthorized places, and that can be a problem besides doing what God had told them specifically to do. So maybe there's a bit of a reason here, but they sort of also just assume that's what's going on and conclude that this must be something that was evil. They were afraid that building an unauthorized altar for worship would cause God, notice verse 18, to be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. And again in verses 19 and 20, they're worried that the result would end up in the whole nation being punished. Now go back in your mind to this morning from the timeline. This is not quite Uh, This is before Joshua makes those two speeches or gives them instructions, but yet they know the Lord. They know his instructions, and they know what he is telling them, and that if the children of Israel are going, the ones from the east side are going to do their own thing, that there might be trouble coming, and the whole nation would be in danger. So they're concerned, I think somewhat rightfully so, but we certainly have a bit of conflict here, and we go straight from an altar being built to making war. And think about it again in context of Joshua. They've won all these victories, all these victories and conquered this land of people that they've been at battle against people who are enemies of the Lord. And now after all that, here they come with a bit of civil war. So there's one altar and three accusations. But let's notice that then before we get to some points for ourselves, there is an explanation. Thankfully, they don't come to blows, as we say, in the sense that there's bloodshed and this great civil war that happens. But an, an explanation is given behind the real purpose of the altar. Now, if you're following along in your Bible, it begins in verse 21, and it goes through about verse 29. So that for the sake of time here, we're not going to read all of those verses, but they're going to uh, give some explanation through those. And we're going to touch on it just a little bit. They say here that it was not built to be used for making offering and sacrifices to the Lord. If you, if you started to scan that, look at verse 22, uh, verse 23. We, that's not the point they talk about of offering burnt offerings or grain offerings. Look down at verse 26, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice. Look at verse 28. Not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice. Look at verse 29. Not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice. Do you see the theme here? They're making their, their case very plain, and they're making it you know, very clear, saying it over and over again. That is not the purpose. The purpose is not to be used for making offerings or sacrifices to the Lord. Rather, instead, look at verse 27. But that it may be, here's our word, a witness, a witness between you and us and our generations after us that we may perform the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore, verse 28, here's our explanation. Therefore, we said that it will be When they say this to us or to our generations in time to come, that we may say this. Here's our explanation. Here is the replica of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, though not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. The two and a half tribes say, no, we're not doing it so that we may offer burnt offerings and sacrifices here, but it's going to serve as a witness between those on the east side and those on the west side who lived in the land of Canaan. The witness, this altar, it would be a witness in the sense that it would remind them and their children, back to our stones and our memorials that we've talked about, that even though they were separated by the Jordan, they were still one nation, united together, Even as we talk about our country, one nation under God, they are still one nation serving under Jehovah, serving Jehovah God. 
Can you imagine, I don't know if you ever happened in your family, but can you imagine years down the road when there is a civil war between the people and those on one side say, you know what y'all are? Y'all are lesser people. You're not full Israelites. You know, y'all are over there. We're all over here. And they start to cause a problem. The, t- the two and a half tribes, Reubenites, Gadites, half tribe of Manasseh say, we don't want that. We want a witness that we did our part, we helped, and we are one nation serving God. And so they call in verse number 34, if you look down at the very end of the chapter and the very end of this account, the new altar was called witness, for it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Near civil war, there was a problem, and it could have come to blows, and it probably could have come to bloodshed, but yet there are some things that are learned here, and they talk about this altar that is called witness. Well, what about us? Are there some lessons that we can take from this near disaster? I think there is, and let's talk about them here. Number one, a failure to communicate clearly can cause conflict. Now, I'm not going to ask for personal examples, all right? You don't even have to give me any amens. That's all right. But I have a feeling some of you are going to have recall to your memory times where you were in this kind of situation, and you go, you know what? That was right. If only I had done that in my situation, then I could have maybe solved myself some trouble, my spouse some trouble, my family, co-workers, my brethren in the church trouble, and maybe that's what it is. Number one, a failure to communicate clearly. What if... What if the two and a half tribes had simply told their brethren as they're going home, hey, by the way, before we cross, we're going to stop and build this altar. Is that okay with you guys? Here's what we're doing. What if? What if they had just said that? How many times have we simply said, well, what if? What if I just had communicated clearly exactly what my intentions were and then the problem could have been avoided? A failure to communicate clearly can result in serious misunderstandings and conflict. How often among family, among brethren, does it go that far before something is said? And it's because maybe we just didn't communicate clearly. And, and by the way, I, I kind of made it, I have to have room, you know, in the bulletin for that word. And so I, but I also underlined it. But, but maybe that word clearly is a part of it, Right. Uh, I won't get into the communication between husbands and wives, but how many times do we think we've communicated, but we've not communicated clearly? I know that's a bit humorous, and it's kind of a shot sometimes at marriage, but let's go back to the church again for just a second. How many times can there be major issues between people when we thought we've communicated, but we've just not done so clearly? Now, there's another C word. Let's add to that. What about calm communication? Calm communication communication can save the day in the end it seems that that could have been the the case when the two two and a half tribes explained their intentions when they gave the explanation then the anger subsided calm reasoning prevailed and the disaster the civil war was averted now yes sometimes there's not clear communication and then yet other times when that is then confronted then calm communication doesn't take place, right? Because we just kind of keep getting upset and ratcheting things up and up sometimes. Maybe you're like me sometimes and you just kind of stay quiet, don't say anything. That's not always the best either. But we understand when it comes to conflict, we have to do our best to be clear and to be calm. And sometimes that can help us as we think about uh, what's going on. In fact, connected with that, if I can add one more in that I didn't put on the the slides, uh, but the Western tribes... The children of Israel on the western side, they kind of came to some faulty conclusions. You know, they kind of came to some false accusations, as we looked at just a moment ago. They sort of rushed to judgment, one might even say, without having all of the information. Sometimes that can be a problem and can cause the conflict to keep going further and further or keep getting hotter and hotter because we assume things, we accuse people of things, And we're not quite doing what we should in that way either. Number three, when possible, give the benefit of the doubt. (coughs) Excuse me. When possible, give the benefit of the doubt. And I didn't even include here, but maybe we could say daily, right? Daily, try to give the benefit of the doubt, thinking no evil. 
Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 5? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, of course, is what we commonly refer to as the love chapter. It's the one that's usually read at weddings to remind people of how true love should be. Not just true love in the sense, of course, of Hollywood and that kind of thing, but biblical true love should be. There's a whole list of things that we should do if we love someone the way that we should behave. One of those listed in verse number five is that love thinks no evil. Now, you would hopefully understand that I would never suggest that we just sort of walk around with our eyes covered or, as we say, rose-colored glasses and think that everyone's just the best and everybody's out to do the right thing all the time. No, sometimes there may be evil intentions or there may be things that are done that shouldn't be done. But yet, when possible, we should strive to give the benefit of the doubt. And kind of back to our last point just a moment ago. Maybe we should strive to refrain from making accusation until the evidence truly warrants the conclusion that there's been something sinful going on. And once again, not rushing to judgment. You know, we think about that so many times in the New Testament. The Bible speaks about that when people say evil of us, that it shouldn't be believed by others because of our character. Because of who we are day in and day out. I think about our elders. We talked about elders this morning for just a moment here in the auditorium. But one of the characteristics, one of the guidelines, we sometimes use the word qualifications for elders, is that they be blameless. And some people would say, well, that's perfect, right? No man's perfect. No, the idea, of course, is that their character is above reproach. That we know when we look at them, when we speak of these men, that if somebody came to me and said, you know what, I saw Charles Abel's out Friday night just drunk, causing trouble in town, that my first assumption would be, well, absolutely not. You must have somebody else. You must have something else. You know, somebody else was in mind. You saw somebody else. I would give him the benefit of the doubt knowing his character. Certainly as an elder of the congregation, even knowing Charles personally. And I know that seems kind of a silly example, and I could have picked out anyone, but that's exactly what we're talking about here, that we give the benefit of the doubt when possible. In fact, once again, connected with that, accusation is not the same as proof. Now, if I go to Charles, and Charles says, well, yeah, you know, something, you know, something happened or whatever, you know, I had a big major problem, and I, you know, whatever, okay, maybe that's true, and maybe he was wrong, he did something, and that was him, but I'm going to try to find out before I go spreading it. Before I go telling others or just, you know, assuming that it was someone, a brother in Christ, that we're able to give the benefit of the doubt. In fact, speaking of accusation, in Acts chapter 24 and verse number 13, Paul is on trial before Felix. Remember, Felix is the one who said, when there's a more convenient time, I'll call for you. Paul's before Felix, and he says in his defense, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. Paul stood before him saying, you can bring it on. You can say what you want, but I know who I am and what I've done, the way I've lived. And I could, I picked on Charles, but I could use an example of anyone here in a sense. We would say, I hear your accusation, but I want to find out a little more. And if I'm going to take to conflict here, before I just open my mouth and blurt something out or gossip, I'm going to try to go to that person, get to the bottom of the situation. Because that's the way that we should handle things. In fact, our answer should very often be what Moses says, or excuse me, what Abram says in Genesis chapter 13 and verse number 8. There was strife between Lot and Abram. We looked at Genesis chapter 12 this morning. But when we think about chapter 13, we're getting ready to go into Lot's problems and what Lot does with Sodom and Gomorrah. But there are problems. Lot, his herdsmen, Abram, his herdsmen, they have problems. So how does Abram handle it? Well, in chapter 13 and verse number 8, he goes to Lot and he says, Please, in the New King James, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. And the King James, if you got the King James, says, We be brethren. I think English Standard Version says, We are kinsmen. And, of course, the New King James says we are brethren. Maybe sounds a little better to the way we normally speak in our English language. But I've always liked that, always stuck with me. We be brethren. Are we brethren? Those words could have prevented maybe hurtful problems, hurtful division. It did prevent division in Abram's case or Abraham's case between his family and Lot's family. Folks, I don't need to tell you or remind you 
that the last thing that God's people need here in 2020, 2021, 2022 is division. To divide into groups and to start biting and devouring one another. Do you remember in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 15 that Paul would say, But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. There's a lot of issues going on in the world, and there will be issues in the church. Unfortunately, people that don't listen, that don't go get someone else's side to a story to try to understand exactly what's going on. Thankfully, in this particular instance, the children of Israel were able to avoid a civil war, although we might say just barely. Just barely were they able to, but they were. But it's because of these lessons that helped them with their conflict resolution that they were able to do that. And as we take this lesson and begin to apply it to our lives, let me encourage you to think about these things. Unfortunately, you may be thinking of conflict already in your mind that you've been through. Maybe not, but you know it'll be coming again. Because as we said Wednesday night, I think it was Wednesday night if I'm not mistaken, in our Bible class, very often the wonderful thing about the church is the people. And very often, the terrible thing about the church is the people, simply because we're people, we're humans. But may we learn from the children of Israel and from Joshua how to avoid civil war. And once again, even amongst the vitriol and anger and division that's going on in our country and around the world today. I I hated to kind of back up in a sense through Joshua, but this was a great uh, kind of different lesson to look at. Maybe a story you've never thought of before, but may we learn about conflict and conflict resolution from the children of Israel here. As we conclude this lesson, we extend heaven's invitation again, as is our custom. This is another one of those lessons that sometimes somebody says, well, I can't respond because somebody's going to think I've got problems with everybody else, and I don't want to come, come forward for that. As we know, that's not the intention of extending heaven's invitation. It's because we're together. It's because we're family, and we have a chance that everyone who leaves here can leave in a right relationship with God. That's why we do it. So maybe you're here and you're not a child of God. We'd be singing to encourage you. We'd be singing so that you would become a child of God even this day and join this family here. But, of course, ultimately the family of God, the church. Maybe you're here and you have done that. Maybe it's a problem with conflict. Maybe it's not. Maybe you're struggling with the things of this life and you just like the prayers of this church. We be brethren. We be, uh, we be having here in this moment an opportunity to encourage one another. I'm thankful that you've come. I'm thankful that we can extend heaven's invitation and that we can sing to encourage you even now as we stand together and as we sing. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free? From your passion and pride, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Be seated, please.
Again, just a couple of notes for you here, a couple of additions in particular about our announcements. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to get a bulletin, please grab one. Um, a couple of additions that we had, one was that Nina uh, Templeton had been dealing with a bad case of vertigo, vertigo and uh, Dawn had said she was needing help even getting around the house, and so they wouldn't be with us today and continue to pray for Miss Nina. Uh, also, uh, Tracy Smitherman, Shannon's father, uh, had taken a fall last week, um, but they had just had him at home, but they came and did x-rays over the course of the end of the week and determined that he did break his other hip. Uh, so that's where Shannon is this afternoon. Uh, she was going to stay with him for a bit, and they're trying to make arrangements and, and things to care for him. And, of course, uh, kind of fearful of doing surgery on him again, although that may be what is needed, so they're trying to make some decisions there. Uh, but we ask for your prayers for uh, Tracy Smitherman as well as Shannon, her sister, and their families as they're trying to care for him. Uh, who else? Any other updates on our sick that we have this afternoon? I did make mention again, my family's not here, Clayton's on the camping trip, but uh, Caden and Caroline had been sick towards the end of the week. Uh, we think with the flu, we found out they may have been around someone that had it, so that may have been what was going on with them. So Hannah kept them home today, but I called her at lunch during the break, and she said they were both feeling some better today, and hopefully by Wednesday we'll be, be back at full strength. Uh, was there anybody else? We're grateful for all those who've been able to be back with us. We've had a lot who have been out, uh, and we're grateful for that, uh, for your attendance again. As far as, our, as far as our other announcements, we just made mention, we first announced it on Wednesday night, uh, or last week, but thankful uh, for Hannah and her children that are with us now, Ezra and Colleyanna and Eliza Jane, and for them being with us today, and of course look forward to their work working with us here. Uh, game night, Friday night at 6 o'clock, if you're interested in being a part of that. And then Care Team 3, there were some cards uh, on the table in the library. We appreciate uh, Heath and Lisa's work with that, and Jeff's been helping some over the last week or two. So uh, if you have any questions, you can see uh, any of them about uh, that if you're on Care Team 3. Anything else we have? Did get a message from Brian that our teens were on their way back and stopped to get lunch and may be here in the next uh, couple of hours. So appreciate your prayers on their behalf. Uh, I think many of them got a little cold last night, but they were okay. And Brian said they were all alive and well. And uh, hopefully will be back amongst us here just in a couple of hours. If you have not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, it is still prepared at this time. And you can make, make your way out the side door there to adult classroom number one uh, or out the back and around and you'll be served. <clears throat> We don't usually announce all the birthdays. I'm looking at the list here. There's a bunch coming up the end of March and the 1st of April. If you uh, like to do that or send cards, you can uh, be sure to check in with those folks. Um, we appreciate uh, all those who do that. If you uh, are able to, we hope that you'll be back with us again on Wednesday evening. We'll assemble together for our Bible classes uh, at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. And I think Trey has our closing prayer after our closing song. Eight hundred forty one, number eight four one. If you find it convenient, let's stand as we sing this song. <clears throat> if the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great, all the whole day through, there's a silver line that shines in the heavenly light. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises, grand. See, be happy, be happy, press hope to the goal. Trust him who leads you here. Keep your soul left on. Be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what tomorrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can see. Sing and be happy, rest hope to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul left on. Be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky.
Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, Lord, just to say how thankful for, we are for the privilege to come and worship you on this day. And thank you so much, Lord, for this day. It's a beautiful day. Please help us to always look to your word and the scriptures for strength, Lord. No matter what trials we're going through, no matter what doubts we may have, please help us always look to your word for strength, and for my brothers and sisters in Christ, for strength and support. Please be with all those that are sick and suffering from different ailments at this time. Guide us and watch over us as we go out into this world. Please help us to show them Jesus Christ through the way that we act and the manner that we care for one another and our character each and every day. In Christ's name I pray, amen. 